The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We call it living history because the whole point is to make it as real as we possibly can. Fire! It's a reward to have the people say, boy, that's a great trail. Of course, it's a, that trail sucks. That's not too good. The levels that, that we found in Alaka Bay were the highest we've seen anywhere within the state. And certainly, there was a significant health risk. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. At its height, Fort Richardson was the largest military post in the United States. Had uh, close to a thousand soldiers here. Fort Richardson was established in 1867. It was the northernmost of the frontier forts throughout now what is the state of Texas to help protect the western movement of the settlers coming out. The fort system was really integral in being able to settle the state. So without the fort system, we wouldn't have had a state of Texas. We wouldn't have been able to, you know, to defend it and be able to inhabit it as we do now. This weekend, we're hosting our annual Living History event. And today, we had 26 school buses roll in here. I'd have a pot in the fire and I would pour a whole lot of bullets. That is cool. There are some people that get everything they need out of reading textbooks um, or in the classroom, but I am not one of those people. You got the basics down. We are giving visitors an opportunity to see what life was like back when this fort was operational. Shoulder, arms. They get to see the soldiers in action and to see what activities might be available to the children who lived in the fort back in the day. It makes that connection to their history. Still there, isn't it? We're out here on a field trip, out here to learn about the 1800s and how they lived and stuff. They didn't have much technology that we have today, I mean, obviously, so they had to put in a little bit more work to do simple tasks. Oh. <laughs> Would you imagine having to do that every day? Yeah. It's hard to get out stains. Company, forward, march! We got to march across the field with guns. Double quick time, march! It'd be pretty scary to know Stay that you're basically about to go fight. Company, charge! Because I don't want to get shot. Like doctors and stuff, like it's a bit harder for them to work. He took care of 50 day troops using the surgeons. It's just crazy how they got through it all with just a little bit of medicine. Fort Richardson has some incredible historic buildings here on site and there are tours available for people who are coming and want to learn a little bit more about it. We still have seven of the original historic buildings still standing, two reconstructed buildings, a museum, an interpretive center. The staff here at Fort Richardson take great pride in, in protecting and maintaining the integrity of, of these historic structures. Fort Richardson has a ton to offer. It not only has the historical aspect, the park has uh, 57 campsites. All of them have water and electricity. We do have limited use cabins, nature trails, we have the historic uh, Rumbling Springs here in Lost Creek. We also have a nine mile multi-use trail that wraps around both municipal lakes, comes out at what we call our North Park over there. We have uh, the historic side of it, lots of hiking, biking, and equestrian. We have a lot to offer here in Jacksboro. An hour from Fort Worth. You just twirl the thing back and forth. And when like kids come out here, they're stunned when I was cooking this morning 
uh, they were like, is that a real fire? Well, yes, indeed, it's a real fire. And yes, that's real smoke, and that's really hurting your eyes. Which work? Okay. <laughs> They're kind of stunned because a lot of kids, they don't smell bacon cooking on a fire. They don't see horses. They don't see uh, gun smoke from a cannon. If history is real from the distance you are from me right now, then it's, it's believable. Having that multi-sensory experience just really helps connect people to that history and, and see why it's valuable and important to conserve that history. We were the closest defensive line to Oklahoma, which was Indian territory. Uh, we were a major contributor in the Red River War campaign. Fort Richardson was a training post for the World War II campaign, and the battalion that trained here became known as the Lost Battalion. Fort Richardson's really unique, and to keep it alive just as long as we possibly can, I think it's the best possible way to honor what's going on out here and all the diverse cultures that have come through here and helped build this place. This is a challenge up here. Robert Newman looks after the Franklin Mountains like no other. His passion for this place is cultivated high up in the hills. A tool in hand. I just take it day by day, one rock at a time. And a plan in his head. He is the trailblazer. Yeah, it's looking all right. Robert's about to turn 79. A cup of Joe and the El Paso Times are his way to kickstart the morning. But I do have a three-star day. The maximum is five stars, so I have a three-star day today. And I don't go out every day. I'm too old to go out and do this every day. You can sense a bit of morning aches and pains for Robert, but the trail calls. I don't mind being out there by myself. I just love sitting there and looking at the scenery out there. Well, this is going to be a pretty rough ride. I'm going to go very slow. Uh, today we are at the Tom Mays unit of the Franklin Mountain State Park. We're going up to where I'm working on the new trail. There's existing trails, well, actually old bulldoze roads, but whoops, <laughs> that are really tough. So I'm trying to put in one that's going to be more user friendly. From four wheel to feet, Robert has another half mile walk up through the rugged terrain to get to his work site. Keep them on the upside. So this I'm gonna leave, because I don't want to push them away from the downside. But this I'm gonna take out, because I want them to get closer to the upside. Robert's a retired math teacher. You know, they used to do all this by hand. They didn't have mechanized stuff. He's been building trails up here all by himself for 15 years. My rest bit. Oh, I hadn't gotten very far today. But, like I say, I'm in no more hurry, or it'll be here tomorrow, too. When I'm out here working on trail, I have basically three settings. The first setting is very slow. It's digging out nicely. The second setting is even slower. And the third setting is stopped. And stopped eats up more time than the other two put together. Peanut butter and jelly. And a Coke. When I'm out here working, uh, most of the time I'm sitting. I just sit down and look and awe at <laughs> what's out here. I've never built a trail across anything like that before. 
Robert's big worry on this trail, a rock slide's dead ahead. This will be a brand new experience. When they start moving, the whole thing starts moving. It scares the heck out of me. We'll see how it goes, and I won't know until I get into it. <laughs> That's uh, something new for me. All right, now this is about where we are right now. We're nearing this first rock slide, right in here. To calm his nerves, Robert goes over the plan with Park Superintendent Cesar Mendez. The idea is to get rid of this section over here because it's too steep. I don't think I have ever met somebody that is so unselfish, so generous. He's willing to spend hours and hours of his life, I mean days, months of his life, devoted to doing something right for the mountains and for the people to enjoy. His mathematician mind uh, helps him to have this greater comprehension that the, sometimes the average person doesn't have. He understands the slopes very well. Uh, he understands drainage. This not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I can see a line through here now. Uh, I think it'll be all right. I have to come through here several more times. <sighs> When I'm at home and I can't get out here, I'm frustrated. I need to get out here. I want to get out here. I don't know. I just love being out here. Over the years, Robert's built more than 12 miles of trail, all by these hands. Building these trails, like I say, it's a challenge to see if I can put in a trail that's going to be hikeable and bikeable and sustainable, one that's going to last more than four, five, six years. You don't know what's here until you get out of your car and get up in the mountain. Just driving by on the freeway over and looking at these, you don't realize how much depth there is, how much variation there is here. And you can get back in some of these canyons and, and feel like you're in a complete other world. It took a good year for Robert to finish the Agave Loop Trail, and it's now open. They're still on the ridge going up. I guess they're gonna do the whole thing. His reward is seeing people that are using their trails, and that's all. Can I hug you? Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, I love your trail. Out of seven days, maybe we come four or five times oh, a week. Oh, well, great, that's fantastic. <laughs> It does help relieve stress. They yeah. just, when you're out here, you're not thinking about anything, anything else except you better concentrate on the trail. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there they are. They're coming back. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Way to go. Good job. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for coming out and riding it. That's what makes it all worthwhile to see y'all come out and ride it. The next morning, there's that familiar sound up on the mountain. Uh, and it doesn't look like Robert's coming down anytime soon. Right now, I still feel good. As long as I make, I'm going to be out here doing this. Back in the early 1990s, a series of events took place that would lead to the largest cleanup of hazardous waste in Texas history. It was nothing short of a shotgun wedding between Alcoa and five government agencies, forced to work together to fix a serious problem. 
And in the beginning, no one had any idea how things would turn out. Our story starts in Lavaca Bay. The year is 1993. Port Lavaca, Texas has long been the home of both fishing and chemical industries. In the late 60s and early 70s, the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, dumped as much as 67 pounds of mercury a day into Lavaca Bay, contaminating what was once a public food source. The health department closed portions of the bay in 1988 for fin fishing and shell fishing. And the information that we have from the health department is that one heavy meal for a pregnant woman could cause birth defects. Uh, oh, no, they didn't know. I, I don't think they knew. So he wants to put in just... Raynell Silcox is a parks and wildlife attorney. She worked on the case throughout the 1990s. I don't think they knew that mercury bioaccumulates, you know, that it doesn't go away, that it never goes away. It just keeps accumulating in your body. Yeah, the levels that, w that we found in Lavaca Bay were the highest we've seen anywhere within the state, even to this day. Kirk Wiles is an investigator with the Texas Department of State Health Services. In those early days, there really was not a lot of information out on mercury contamination in seafood. It was a hotly debated issue. Texas Department of Health has closed this area because of mercury contamination from, from Alcoa aluminum plant. I believe in good sound scientific data and the data tends to indicate there is a problem and this is why the health department did close down this area to fishing. All right, those years. The stakes are high in Port Lavaca and throughout the state. Texas residents face difficult dilemmas. I have three children. I have one boy that's 13, I have one boy that's 11, and then I have a little girl that's seven. It bothers me greatly that because I chose to live here and, and the lifestyle that I have may be affecting my children now, and, and that bothers me a great deal. We've got to conserve energy and natural resources today. We can't wait for tomorrow. When I first began in 1975 trying to deal with the issue of fish contamination in Lavaca Bay, industries in the area were in probably a state of denial. But vast improvements in the field of toxicology meant that industry could no longer ignore how pollutants impacted the environment. And increased public awareness created pressure on companies to act more responsibly. Meanwhile, nothing was being done to clean up the bay. We had a large portion of Lavaca Bay that was closed to uh, any consumption of fish. And uh, where do we start? Ken Rice is the Natural Resource Damage Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've been working on this project for over 15 years. And the turning point came about when this particular site was declared a Superfund site in 1994. Though many believe the mercury has stayed in a local area, the full extent of the pollution is unclear. Comprehensive and expensive studies are needed to determine the scope of the problem. To determine how we will restore this area, or if we restore this area, the cost to go in here and get up contaminated sediment and put the bay bottom back to what it originally was, you're talking lots of money. Total length 917, species code 625. The technology may not be there right now, but through these test studies and things, we'll come up with it. Nobody ever said this job would be easy, though. We're very right in, in saying this was not going to be an easy job. It's been a long road. It's been a difficult road. The cleanup of Lavaca Bay was shaping up to be complicated and expensive. And the legal logistics overwhelming three state agencies, two federal agencies, and Alcoa, as many as 50 people at the negotiating table. Um, yes, in the beginning, it was um, pretty difficult. Arguing and hashing things out. Adversarial. Walking away from the table. Acrimonious. Coming back to the table. Well, something had to be done. I don't know what exactly happened to change that, 
but um, there I, well, I think part of it was Ron Waddell. There were times when I wasn't sure it was going to work. I was afraid that we were all going to have to just walk away and call it quits and turn it into a battle where the lawyers could make a lot of money. About the time Ron Waddell got involved, the people at Alcoa did something unexpected. They owned up to the problem and vowed to clean up the bay. Alcoa can't wait. Because we are an old, old company, we have a lot of legacy projects. And what I mean by that is when these plants operate in the 40s and the 50s and even the 60s, there were no regulatory restrictions on what needed to be done. And in fact, the whole art of toxicology was poorly, poorly understood. In the early 1990s, we'd come to the realization that we were going to have a lot that we would need to do. The negotiators used a new approach called habitat equivalency analysis, in which environmental damage is compensated through habitat replacement projects. It was a breakthrough. It was a huge breakthrough. You know, when you start talking about money, especially when you're dealing with corporations, that's when everybody gets nervous and upset. So if we leave it um, just discussing acreage and projects, people get, they start to get excited. In the Alcoa case, all sides agreed on a course of action. Nearly a million cubic yards of contaminated sediment was dredged from the bay floor. That's enough to fill up two-thirds of the Astrodome. The sediment was contained within this 500-acre island next to the Alcoa plant. Further south, an 11-acre oyster reef and a 70-acre marsh were constructed, all paid for by Alcoa. $130 million is probably a good estimate. Nobody ever gave me a blank checkbook, but they always gave me a big checkbook, as long as I was doing the right thing with the money. When a corporation can put their name on a beautiful project, like a marsh or the piers and docks that they built, and have their name connected with something positive like that that's helped people, then I think that's good for them and it's good for the community. And Once there's buy-in by the company, and they're involved in the restoration and they see what we're trying to do, that's when they learn to appreciate the environment. Take Port Lavaca for instance. It is an industry town. These people are dependent on jobs. However, they want quality of life as well. They want clean air, clean water. And this is a model for any area that works with industry. Most people would probably say that today, compared to 20 or 30 years ago, our water is cleaner and our air is cleaner, but that doesn't mean that you can stop. I mean, that doesn't mean it's anywhere near clean enough or, I mean, obviously it's not. We still have problems. But from now on, environmental negotiation may get a lot less contentious. What started out in 1993 as a shotgun wedding between industry and government has slowly matured into a bona fide marriage, for better or for worse, through good times and bad.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.